and convert and generate an internal representation that is suitable for, for those paths. It, it generates micro operations, which are very small units, <coughs> atomic units of, of using or modifying uh, user variables. Maybe. So, for instance, for this statement that copies register 1 to register 2, uh, in the old style of variable tracking, uh, we would generate two different micro operations. One that uses register 1 with a note that this has to do with user variable B, and one that says uh, register 2, which has to do with variable Q. And the end result will be a table that looks somewhat like this. So before, say, before processing these two micro operations, if we had, say, register, uh, sorry, variable Q bound to register 4, and are located at register 4, and variable X located at register 2, after these two micro operations, we would have variable P. Well, now we know that variable P is in register 1. And we know that variable Q is in register 2. So we unbound red, red, register 4 because Q was modified in the process it was set. And we unbound variable X because register 2 was modified. So it no longer holds the value for variable X. Now, there are a number of other uh, variations on that theme. Say so there is a, a micro operation that is a copy that doesn't modify the, the, the variable, so it keeps its previous bindings, but it, it adds another binding for its variable. There are use no far, which is. Uh, it took me a while to figure that one out, but basically it, it removes a little bit. Uh, and if any other, if any variable is bound to that location, well, it's not anymore. Now, this is not used for anything. This is this expression that, that appears there. And a clobber actually modifies the variable and, and the, the expression that it's bound to. Then we also have calls that are meant to tell the, the data flow analysis that I'll talk about in a moment. In a moment. That it, every, every register that is called clobber and every piece of memory that might be modified elsewhere has to tie at a point. It, it, it won't be able to, you can't hold any other value at that point. And we have notes that, that indicate changes in the stack pointer because this past does, it has to track the stack pointer in some, in some cases. To, to generate um, frame address uh, related to analysis. And finally, there are the, the micro operations that have to do with variable tracking and assignments. Those are the most recently added, and most recent means two or three years ago. So if you have nonsensical code as this that sets memory location whose address is in register 3 to the register 3 to the valid register 3 itself, we will have a use that binds some value, that is an RTL construct used by CSLib, uh, to register 3, and then uh, a set uh, that says, oh, by the way, uh, this value is now also available and this memory location. Memory uh, goes under is the same value number 10. So after these two micro operations, we will get to a table like this. Uh, value 10 is now available in two different locations, in register 3 and at memory, whose address is given by a value number 10. So, I have omitted the mode, SI mode or whatever, P mode, because it's not relevant for this part of the, the discussion, but you may want to keep in mind that they're there. Um, now, when we find a debug 
Newton, the mice variable i to x through 3, will generate micro operation that tells the data flow analysis that variable i now is located in, well, its value is given by what is in value number 10. So we could then look up in the same table, well, value of 10, where is it available? Then we can generate the location for the variable i. Now, we, the data flow analysis will use this micro operations. What it first does, it initializes the entry block with the, the incoming parameters. So, say if the incoming parameter A is in register 4, there will be an node indicating that. There will be uh, the, the, the and uh, the output of the, the entry block will be that. Now, for each of the blocks, and we run the data flow pass, for each of the blocks, we will combine the sets that, that, that uh, have confluence to the one block that we're looking to. And then we'll do, uh, I will explain this in a moment, but we will combine uh, by union the available expressions of the old style uh, expressions, old style variables, and we'll do an intersection for the variable tracking and assignment uh, equal registers and values. Then we do a kind of canonicalization to, to make some recursion, recursive uh, algorithms uh, more shallow. And we then, for that one, for each one of these blocks, we go through the, the micro operations for that block, processing what, what changed. So, confluence works like this. So, you may remember variable P that was tracked in the old style, and it was known to be in register 1. And variable Q, now that is incoming from a different block, just to make things interesting, uh, that is in register 2. Then we have in one block, uh, uh, value number 10 is bound to a memory location, and in the other, for, uh, the value 10 is equivalent to a different value number 13. Uh, there is a variable 11 here that is bound to a register 3. The other block doesn't have a value 11 bound to anything, but it has a value 13, which is bound back to value 10. So we, we don't have any useful locations there, but we have an equivalent. And we have finally for our variable i, that if in one case is bound to value 10, the other case is bound to now, when we combine that, what do we do? For all style variables, we take the union of the operation. So, P has something there, it doesn't have anything else in the other one, nothing plus something, it results uh, that is a null register. Same thing for T. Now, for variable I, the intersection is interesting because Value 10 and variable 13 do not look the same. But if we go recursively looking for an equivalence, we will find that in this plot on the right, value 13 is actually equivalent to value 10. Right? Because if you go 13 is equivalent to 10, so we add that to the intersection. And we do the same for values 10. 11 and 13, but we don't find any equivalences. We don't find anything in the intersection, so we don't add this to the result. So the blocks, the, the processing of the block starts with something like this. Well, not quite, because let's start from a different example now to show you how we can equalize these blocks. Now we'll start. If at the end of the intersection or union we got something like the above, in which value 10 is equivalent to 13, value 13 is equivalent to 10 and 15, and it's also known to be in register 5. And variable i is known to be in register 7, but also uh, its value is value 13. 
Then we're going to rearrange things so that the, the value whose identifier is the least, the, the, the smallest number, will collect all of the equivalences, all of the expressions, and a list of the equivalent values. And each of the other values will just point back to it. So that's what we got. Say i is equivalent to value 13 and register 7. So we push register 7 to 13. Except that 13 is equivalent to 10. So we push register 5 and 7 to value 10, which will then collect the, the list of other equivalences. And so we get sort of a star-shaped uh, equivalence uh, set for value 10. It has 13 and 15, and they point back to it. So it's a kind of the center. And this makes other operations more efficient. So now, for to to output the locations, what we do is for each block, we 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 have a look at what. How, how the previous block ended, and how the previous in, in, in the code, in the, 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 the later on, think assembly output. So the previous block uh, ended with this state, and now we have to switch to this other state, which is the incoming state for the block. Now, uh, we compare, compare those sets, so this, these are different, so we have to add notes for these. And then, as we process each of the micro operations, uh, when they modify binding, we have to note, take note of the fact, and possibly emit new locations. So, this is how we do that. So, say that a number of values were modified, binding for some value were modified. We do not want, users don't care about this value. Are internal representation only. So we propagate for the values. We would propagate two other variables that depend on these values that, hey, this change you have to recompute. Then for each of the changed variables, the, the, the actual user declarations, we change the list of locations available for them for, for each variable. And we try to turn each of these locations at a time into an actual expression. So if it is a register or memory with a constant address, then we already got it. Now if it is if it involves any value, then we have to expand the value term recursively. And if that one value references another or is uh, the sum, the, the addition of two different values, whatever, we can have that sort of complex expressions in there. We will expand that and, 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 and the result. if we get a result, then this is the value, this is the location of the variable. If we don't, then we try the next location and so on. When we do find something, we will take note of the dependencies. We will remember that this variable depended uh, on this value and this value depended on this other value and so on. So that we can modify when things change. Now, sometimes, and you, you may have noticed that in the previous slide, there are loops. One value points to the other, the other points back to, to the one. So we have to deal with the sort of cycle. And the way we do it is when we reach a cycle, when we realize that we are of the cycle, we assume that <coughs> that variable, that, well, there, that value, does not have any available location. That's a tentative assumption, and if it happens to be true, when we reach it back, returning from the, the recursion cycle, then we will confirm that indeed it doesn't have any uh, available locations. Now, if, if we happen to find a location for it afterwards, then we will notify them so that the, the dependent values so that they can recommend. And if, if we reach the end of, of, of all the computation and, and all of the, the pending uh, values that haven't had a location found for them, will be confirmed as 
with our allocation. This avoids uh, some problems, some serious problems, problems that we have when we just kind of dumbly plan expanding values into locations. We generally generate a lot of useless RTL that we eventually will be able to use because one of the, the, the components of the expression didn't have any available locations for it. Or <coughs> sometimes we, we had a, a, a very deep tree with many, which we re tried repeatedly to compute a location for a sub value that really sucked. So this, this, this algorithm is now sort of linear on the size of the, the equivalence graph. So I'm pretty happy about this. Now, it doesn't deal with a particularly difficult problem, which is that sometimes variables are alive in more than one location at a time. Say, variable lives in memory, but for one uh, interval in the program, it is loaded into a register. And then we modify, or before we modify that one register, it is live in both locations, and we want to take note of this fact. Because if you're in the, the debugger and you tell the debugger to modify the variable, you want both locations to be modified. We don't deal with that at this moment, but that's a bug. And that's a bug for which we don't really have the proposed fits. Well, I mean, it can never, never be conservative. You can't ever catch all locations conservatively. So it's about to modify variables from inside the debugger. So you're saying that it's about to modify a variable from the debugger because you cannot keep track of all the available locations. Conservatively figure out where it's for. Okay, I can imagine I can imagine some corner cases in which we couldn't involving aliasing memory aliasing, but but <coughs> there are a number of pretty easy cases that I mean, we can right do a better job of right. the, 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 the riches that make these pills to the stack and reload it. Uh -huh. Then you're still on the stack. Yeah. Well, it's dead, but it's still on the stack. So if you expect, uh -huh. you expect it, it's still there. Yeah. But we won't update it because there will be no more which is now no more use. Well, if, just, if, just if it's still there, there, if the stack stuff was not modified, then there would be a modification. A valid location for the variable. So, yeah, like partial updates of the text box. So, one of the clearly is still there. Sorry, I wasn't going to say that the value is still there. If you reuse the text box, then you will notice that it was modified. Half of the value is still there. So, you need to update that. Yeah, that that begins to get tricky. Or, like, I computed the derivative. Yeah, see, I'm not saying this is an easy problem. Oh, Quite the opposite. I think just modifying values is not something we should be concerned about. But the fact, that that there, the fact that there are some pretty difficult cases doesn't sound to me like an excuse to not deal with it in the simple ones. Well, I think we shouldn't deal with them if it makes law breaking in any way slower or makes it even more difficult. Okay, that's because a, it's already that's a valid position, I guess. Uh, I, I, at least for this special case of modifying things. Yeah, here's the here's the here's the one to blame for all this problem. <laughs> to modify 
important that you never say a, a you never give a, a false impression. It's better to give a true impression of I can't help you with that than a false impression that this probably works. Because if it doesn't work in all cases, then you know the mind is hard.
turns out to be a huge expression that is now used. I mean, say, a huge uh, expression that adds and multiplies and that does something to the incoming value of a register that we cannot even compute the incoming value, so that, that is pointless. But, I mean, uh, this is an, another problem, one of limiting the expression size. We have currently a depth limit on the expressions, but that doesn't always suffice to avoid getting dwarf to uh, out of the trouble. And then, another issue with, with, with parallel locations is that, say, if a variable is available, yeah, all five minutes, okay. Yeah, perfect. Well, not really, I wanted more discussion. We have more discussion just in another time. That's fine. Uh, this is being recorded, right? That's the main point. I hope. Yeah, this is a breakdown. So, uh, if, if nobody was listening here, uh, the recording might be useful for someone in the future. So, uh, but evidently people are listening here too, which is good. Uh, so, consider a variable is available in a memory location and at some point it is also in a register. And we want to represent that. But it's sort of silly to say, oh, at this range it's available in this memory location, in this range it's available in both, and in this other range it's available in the memory location. We could just submit one location for all this range and a shorter location for, for the smaller range. Now, I have no clue how to do that. I mean, the way uh, the verbal tracking pass is structured and the interface with the, uh, the, the debugging, the location information output is not suited for this kind of uh, sub permanence, as I call it. It's, it just, where is this variable? Here is the set of, of, of expressions where you can find it now, and that it overrides that. So this might have to be re-engineered to, to, to generate better location information. And then there's the problem that I alluded to before, which is that we, we don't always recognize equivalences when we shoot. I mentioned stack pointer tracking, but there are other situations in which we have pointers that are equivalent and we don't realize that, or in expressions in general that are equivalent. And we should really do a better job about that because when we have an expression coming from one block and another expression coming from another block, if we cannot recognize that they're equivalent, then we're throwing away information that might be important. Um, now, uh, this is the loss of the block information, so it's not as important as, as say, generating incorrect book information. But, Still, it, it, it is something that could be improved. Now, an actual reason, a problem that I introduced recently that won't be too hard to fix, and might still tackle this one, uh, is that so we, we have the data flow sets, and we also have a, a table maintained by CSD Lib, um, and this one carries information that we use to carry the data flow set. Basically, I removed that from here because they were redundant. Turn out that the, the confluence operation depended on their being also available here in the data flow sets. So it should be not too far to fix to recover some loss of the bugging code that we had before. Uh, but it, uh, it gets trickier when, when we talk about stack pointers. Mutable stack pointers, because then we have to recognize equivalences that even CSD lib apparently cannot recognize. Now, the, the confluence operation currently is, is sort of uh, we combine one block, uh, one set, the current set with another incoming block, we combine that, and then, oh, there's another block, okay, combine that too, and so on. And that is kind of well, it works, but it's <coughs> possibly not ideal. I have entertained for some time the thought that we might get more efficient, more efficient algorithm by looking at all of the blocks uh, at a time instead of combining them one at a time. And one one particular case in which it might matter is that, say, currently we do 
nuclear re recursion of values, we, we try to find patterns going, say, back down, right? We have a value that is B, if we can find an equivalent expression, and it's three, equivalence three, three, uh, and, and, and so on. And this is, this feels backwards. We, we, if we could start at, say, constants and registers, which we can presume to be the same, and from that try to find values that are equivalent values that use them, that might be far more efficient. So I have a hunch that this might be the case, but I haven't worked out how to do that. So uh, what I do know is that this involves some global value numbering uh, down in RTL, so no SSA, which should be fun. But, um, so contributions are welcome. Right. <laughs> yeah, one, one uh, a relatively mechanical fix that, that could be uh, that could bring us some performance, some additional performance for, for uh, variable tracking is that it's currently implemented with a single hash table for each set with old style variables that are not gameful registers and have to be dealt with in a certain way and values with their location lists and uh, variables there are uh, in registers that have to be dealt with in a different way. So if we could just split them into separate tables, each one dealt with in its own way, that might be a win. So if someone wants to get start getting their hands dirty, that might be a uh, start. So, um, this is what I wanted to, to tell you about. I hope it was useful. I hope someone got interested. <laughs> and I'm available to, to address any further questions and, and discuss plans that I have and thoughts that, that I still have, I hope. <laughs> <laughs>